Mark Wilson grew up loving comics and drawing, so it's not surprising he's become an award-winning illustrator and author. He's passionate about Australian history and the environment, and you can see these issues, he explores these issues in his exquisite books. Let's say good morning now to Mark Wilson, a highly awarded and recognised author and illustrator. Mark, how are you? Very good, thank you, Sue. It's very good to be here, actually. It's lovely to be here with you. So when you were a kid and you liked drawing comics and all that sort of stuff, what did you draw? Well, being an illustrator, I'll show you. <laughs> Phantom. The Phantom. I was obsessed with Phantom comics. Actually, I was obsessed with all types of comics. Um, to the stage that my principal at Sale Tech School banned me and my little comic club mates from bringing comics to school and I was responsible for having them banned in the entire school. <laughs> I'm quite proud of that. I would be too. Yeah. What do you think is, why is it so important for kids like you to do that imitation of comics and things that they love? Why shouldn't that be banned? I, I was told by, not him, not by... Um, my principal, but by one of my teachers that, look, look, Mark, if you keep reading comics, you'll never amount to anything. <laughs> I do, I actually recall that being said to me, but I was so, I didn't really um, care what teachers told me like that. I just had my own, I think I was very determined at a very early age to pretty much be me. I, I, don't, I didn't think I had a lot of confidence as a kid when I was there as a child, but now I look back, I think, wow, I did a few things that sort of said, well, you know, I, you know I'm going to do this and uh, that's the way it's going to be. So we did still bring our comics to school, hidden nice flat under our school jumpers. And we did have our little comic club, but we didn't have it right in front of the principal's office in the quadrangle. <laughs> we had it about two miles away at the back of the sale oval. You're very smart. That's very strategic. So yeah. how did you go from the Phantom and being obsessed with comics and drawing to becoming an illustrator and an artist? Uh, well, the connection is that I, I, I don't know whether I was good at good naturally at drawing or whether I was just obsessed with, with wanting to draw as well as they did in the comics. So I used to trace the Phantom like that. And my brother and I used to fight over the piece of tracing paper in the wheat bix packet. We, we'd actually fight over it and you'd get about half each, which is the size of this, okay, out of the wheat bix packet. And that had to last me for two weeks because we didn't have a lot of money and we only shopped for food every two weeks, okay? So I had to make this piece of paper last. So I'd trace in pencil, all my phantom, then I'd rub it out and trace something else and rub it out and do this for two weeks with my one little piece of paper. And uh, that's how I learned to draw. So eventually I could just draw the Phantom uh, without needing the piece of paper. I could draw all these muscles and all that sort of stuff. So I basically had a grounding in um, costume and figure drawing uh, as a fourth grader. Wow. Third, fourth grader at school. And I, I do recall in grade two, actually doing other people's drawings for them. I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I do recall in Mrs. McKenzie, who was my grade two teacher at Sale State School, lovely teacher, beautiful teacher. Uh, I do remember sitting up the back and doing other kids' drawings in that grade two classroom. So, so there you go. So you're also a musician. Do you think it was always going to be illustration or did the two creative things fight oh, for a look, while? Anything. I'll create anything. Um, the, the music is a chance to be with mates, whereas as an illustrator, painter, um, storyteller, writer, you're on your own. I'm here in the studio on my own. But when I write songs, my mate rings me up and we talk about the melody and the lyrics. I write the lyrics, he writes the melody. And Jim does all the production and, and um, all the other instruments. So it's a collaboration and I love that. And that's why I've always, as an, as an illustrator, you can't do it as an author because they expect me to illustrate my own books. 
So I haven't got illustrators I work with, but I work with Jackie French and Mark Greenwood and Corinne. I've illustrated a book with Corinne way back. So it's a lovely sort of collaboration. And I'm in, I'm in a situation very luckily where the publishers allow me to communicate with my illustrator. So I'll talk to Jackie and, and Virginia and all the other people, or Mark Greenwood, whoever it is, and talk about what I'm going to do, what they'd like. Or oh, Gary Crew, he was a master at that. Uh, in fact, Gary got me my first, uh, one of my first picture book jobs. So. Oh, truly. What book was that? Well, that was a weird story uh, called Valley of Bones. Um, fantastic picture book um, where he needed um, somebody who could draw maps. And I had been a map maker in the army in the early 70s. So he, he, when he heard about this and he knew I was an illustrator, that matched what he wanted for this Valley of Bones book where we had maps and all sorts of things. In it. So, yeah, so Gary got me that book and then we did um, probably six or seven others together at uh, Lothian. And then I started branching out and working with other publishers as well. So, And then just after that, I um, submitted a few stories to Lothian and Helen Chamberlain said, oh yeah, we'll do these. So all of a sudden I didn't get a rejection uh, for many years <laughs> from a story. So I was very spoilt when I started being a writer. Just about everything I wrote, Lothian accepted. So, and when people would say to me, oh, gee, what's it like when you get a rejection? Well, so I, well I haven't had one yet, <laughs> which but was quite strange. On that note, did they ever come, the rejections ever come? Because I think all uh, of us get rejected at some point. So, look, one of my publishers don't send you rejection letters. They just don't answer you. <laughs> <laughs> That's subtle. <laughs> I've had a lot of not... Re, uh, not um, I've had a lot of no responses. Let's put it that way, to be subtle. I don't know who's going to see this. <laughs> so when that happens, how do you respond? Do you kick the door and whinge or do you go, okay, I'm going to do another publisher. Good. <laughs> I send it straight to another publisher, unchanged, and see what they say. And my wonderful publisher, Wendy Hollow Books, they have picked up just about every book I've sent to someone else that have been rejected, they've taken it and they have all done really well. So it just shows you that one, a rejection from one publisher does not mean that that's not a good story. Exactly. And I, I think, I actually, the, the first real rejection I got was what I thought was my best ever story, which was very strange. Um, is that published now? Yes, it's yeah, called The is... Little Wooden Horse. Oh. It's a little wooden horse, and it's about uh, it's about the, uh, the the first fleet. It's about little girl and boy orphans in London get caught for stealing bread, um, you know, imprisonment, sent to Australia with the first fleet, and arriving here. So it's a, and it was a part of a it was actually part of a novel, but we turned it into a picture book. The second part was going to be the first two years here trying to survive in the colony, which was almost starvation times. Uh, that became another book with Wendy Hollow. Okay, so it's very, um, very complicated. But uh, yeah, that was rejected. And I thought that was easily the best thing I'd written to date. And then uh, Wendy Hollow picked up one of those books in that series. Well, that actual book, um, uh, The Little Wooden Horse, published it. And it's the first book now in the set of the three convict series. That's an amazing story. Mark, how do you know that you've got an idea that you want to work on? How does your inspiration work? Oh, look, I've just got so many ideas floating around in my head. There's no one... Look, my main thing is I want to connect emotionally with the reader. I actually want to make them cry or, or feel or, you know, get their heart thumping a little bit. Um, it's like music. You, there is no point playing a piece of music unless you get some sort of reaction. Oh, that's rubbish. I'm leaving, you know. You pick up their the drink and walk out the door or whatever. You want a reaction because as a creator, you're trying to communicate. That, you, don't, you wouldn't do it otherwise. An art, the artists who sit there in their little hut in the bush, they're the one reaching out the most. 
but they would say, oh, no, I'm a hermit. I'm just out here to create for myself. You're not. You're trying to, you wouldn't take those things out and put them there in the book, in the painting, in the song, unless you were trying to um, communicate your emotion. You wouldn't do it. You wouldn't bother. You know, you just grow your veggies and do what you do. So when do you know that you have to really pay attention to that idea, that that thing bubbling in your head has to come out? Oh, it just does. There's a day when, you know, oh, I've got to get out to the studio. Um, I know how that's... I, I actually let a lot of things ferment just in my head. So when I'm walking, I walk three times a day for about 20 minutes, half an hour, and I get so much um, inspiration and so much uh, information on how, oh, yeah, I know how I can do that. And it's all actually not working. I think it was Morris Kletzman who inspired me to not take my moments of doing nothing as doing nothing, as time to let things ferment in your head. But I think the human brain is a, a strange thing and it's, I, I've equated it like cooking, you know, like a slow cooker. You, um, you, you see a, um, a metal or a brass button and you, and you put it aside and you say, oh, I'll look up at that later and then you might be doing something. You say, oh, I wonder where that button came from. Then you find it's your grandpa's, well, it is actually sitting there. It is actually my <laughs> grandpa's button from his coat in the First World War and that sort of wow. thing. So then I'll research that. Oh, wow. Oh, what's the connection there? Oh, isn't it horrible how the women had to stay home? They didn't know. So then I thought, oh, my mother's eyes, what would she say if she saw me in the trench? Yeah. So it's all this stuff. Mm. Round Look, and when, round. Off you go. Get a little idea. When you talk about it like that, it sounds so easy. You go, wow. But creativity isn't always easy, is it? It actually is if you let it happen. Everybody's, well, no, generalisation. Not everybody. Most people try and force it. Oh, I've got to create something. Right, I've got... And it's very hard because people aren't like me. They haven't got all day and night doing what you do. They might have jobs, children, a virus, all sorts of things going on that, um, that get in the way, little doors in the way of you creating. If you... Oh, and, of course, money... <laughs> <laughs> you need that. If you want to do a painting, you still need the $50 to buy that canvas and stretcher and your $9 of paint uh, that costs $9. You, so you, there are all these little things, economic, family, health, all sorts of things that get in your way. If you are free to create, if you have the money to get your paint there and all that stuff or your computer with your word processor and all that and your your reference, which is all within the computer now, if you want it to be. If all that's there, it's easy to create. The hard thing is to start. Absolutely. To write down that first word or that first paragraph or sentence or put that first line of a pencil mark on the canvas, that's the hard bit. The second you do that, off you go. It's easy. Yeah. So that's where the pushing comes. Get get that one word, that get one. Get started, and and a lot of that is having the confidence to get it started. A lot of people put off the getting started because they don't think once they do they can create something good. They don't have to. They don't have to look. The first thing when I do, I did a Zoom session into a um, St Paul's in um, a town in Queensland yesterday, and the first thing I hold up is this. And I get one of the kids on the Zoom, on the other end of the Zoom session, I get one of the kids to stand up and read it out loud to the other kids who all have to write it down. And that's all we do. And then we go and have, we talk and have fun, talk about books, do drawing all sorts of stuff. Then when we finish, I get the, the little girl to stand up and repeat what she said at the start of the lesson. Can she remember what she said? That is the thing. You just have to start. Your first draft will be rubbish. Mine is. Always is. I don't even show it to my daughter till I've done probably seven or eight drafts. Then I show it to my wife and my daughter. My wife will take it to work and get comments on the, on the story at work, which is another whole story with my last book, Eureka. You wouldn't believe the story behind that. 
unbelievable. My wife, I look very, I'll praise you to 10 seconds. My wife took my story to work just to pass around, which I asked her to do, get comments. Her friend was almost in tears. She said, this is my family story. My family came out from China 170 years ago to work on the gold fields, right? Young boy, 17, on his own. Exactly how I'd written my story. Fiction turned out to be true. Jeez. Chris Martin's her name. And here she is. I, I added this to the book later because it's basically her family story. That little girl there, this is six generations wow. of Catherine Martin's family. Come out from China in 1850 uh, as a 17 year old boy to escape persecution in the civil wars. This, her, this little girl's sister works with my wife Roz up at Rehab 2, the hospital up in Frankston. That's unbelievable, isn't it? it, it that's where writing is such a strange and wonderful thing, oh, you know, the way these absolutely. things happen. Absolutely. Uh, synchronicity, um, weirdness, you know, I don't know what it is, but all these little things come out. It, almost every book that I've written has got some strange, weird little connection with a family, a past or whatever. Isn't that magic? I don't know. It's, it's Ma strange. For me, it. when I start, it's words because I don't draw. What about for you when you author and illustrate a book? What comes first, the illustrations or the words? The idea. The idea can be a photo. I'll see a photograph, um, i.e. I found this in our family photo album. Oh, gee. Not, not this big. It was tiny. It was, you know, tiny as the photographs were in those days. And I'd flick past this 100,000 times in our family photo album since I was three. When I was 27, I noticed the photograph and found out all about it. And I found out that that little boy behind the machine gun was my grandpa, who was only 16, I think, and went to war as a boy soldier. First World War. And I thought, oh, wow, that'd be pretty incredible. Why is he in a uniform? Why are they taking the photograph? And basically, they took the photographs of the boy soldiers, you know, in case, obviously, uh, they got killed. So they had something to send back to mum. So I researched it and wrote My Mother's Eyes sitting there almost that afternoon. It happened to be Anzac Day, and I was watching the Anzac Day parade. In, uh, and I was going down to the Frankston one. But for some reason, I didn't this day. I didn't go down to Frankston. It's eight, about 1986 or so. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, uh, and, uh, this old, really old guy comes on. The interview walks up to this old guy. And he's got his grand, grandson with him, uh, boy, something like that. And he was, they were talking. I thought, oh, wow. You know, what a story. And I basically wrote the final letter on the final page of of my mother's eyes sitting there watching the telly. And then I spent the next three weeks working back to start the story. Wow. I had my emotional response in the final letter where the boy's writing to his mother from the trenches, right? So I had the emotional connection with my audience, my idea, and I just wrote that down, wrote that letter and that never changed. I went back and wrote the story and came back to that letter from the start of the book. That's amazing. Mark, Often you that's also collaborate. Do you um, prefer collaborating or working on your own? Do you have a preference? Oh, I'm a control freak, so working on my <laughs> own. <laughs> I am. I am. I, I was so tempted... When I, when I collaborated with authors, I was so tempted to suggest things, <laughs> which you just don't do. You're an author. You know what it'd be like if the author rang you up and said, Sue, look, you know, on page four, why don't you take that second paragraph out? It's just waffling. <laughs> Could you do that to someone? Well, it'd depend. If you had a relationship, like with Gary Crew, you did. How many books have you two done together? Oh, seven or eight. Yeah. So would you have that relationship with Gary that you could have said to him, right? Oh, no, I wouldn't. Out. Look, no, no, we're talking about some of the best writers, children's writers in the world, right? Corinne, 
um, Jackie French, Mark Greenwood, you name it. They, they are the best mm. at what they do. I would never, ever correct them. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you what, if I did, they would come back and say why what they've done is better than what I suggested and make it quite clear. <laughs> Mark, it has been such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, I'm just looking in the background on that last question that I meant to ask you. In the background, there are those gorgeous, I love seeing these illustrators' sketches and all those yes. different little. Oh, there. Is that something you do a lot there for of? You either, by the way. That's <laughs> Sorry? always there. Oh, I'd that love is that. There. Is it? I'll bring it over a bit so you can see it. Do you do I'll that for every book? Yeah, this is how they start. I get some reference photographs of people. That's in a market in Afghanistan. Um, I do sketches of soldiers. I get some photographs and do sketches from them. Then I might do a little painting or two, lots of drawings. I make notes, and that's all before I start. Wow. And uh, I was uh, there's a soldier. He's a veteran, and he's um, he's suffered from some post traumatic stress, and uh, he's uh, written a little story about. Um, you know, what the little boy's walking around the house looking for his dad, but his dad's in Afghanistan. And so where is he? He's not in there. He's not in the cupboard. Where is he today? And he'll be out in the, uh, in the Jeep in the desert. And then he looks in the kitchen. Oh, he's not in there. Where is he today? That's the next day. And he might be doing something else and something else. And it's, it's him leaving, doing all the things a soldier does, and then coming back. And this soldier's dealing with post-traumatic stress, wrote this story, and I'm going to illustrate it. Oh, fabulous. That'll be yeah, great. Army, I think the ADF are going to publish it. But yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how that's all going to work yet. I've uh, just sorted out the pub, the, uh, the printing and all that yep. with uh, my friend Will, and uh, we'll see where we go. So I'm about to start that one. I had to finish, I had to finish my new book, which is... Um, story about a war nurse, First World War. Um, do, can I show you quickly? Yes, or please do. Time? No, I'll no, we've got a few it. minutes. Just, I'd love to see it. I've just written this story, illustrated. It's just gone off to the printer, and it's about this uh, beautiful woman. Her name's Rachel Pratt. She was a, a nurse in the First World I'll bring it up close so people can see that if they're looking at the screen. And um, she, uh, she was an Australian war nurse, she was working on some soldiers uh, in a hospital tent on the front in France, First World War. The Germans came over and bombed the hospital, the tent, and a, a bomb actually went off right behind her and uh, flung her to the floor. She, um, she stood up and she could feel blood. She had a wound in her shoulder and through her back and into her lung was a piece of shrapnel, and a piece of shrapnel. Uh, and she was bleeding, she was finding it hard to breathe. She kept working on her patients. We don't know exactly how long, um, between minutes, hours, there's no record. I can't find any record of exactly how long she worked, but basically until she collapsed. Oh my goodness. She did survive, but she carried that shrapnel in her lung for the rest of her life. And she um, suffered post-traumatic stress lived on her own, never went back to country Victoria. She lived in the sort of Western district over there somewhere. And uh, she stayed in Melbourne the rest of her life as a bit of a loner. She looked after returned soldiers in a hospital as well for years and years and years after the war. So there's a brave person. And uh, about, I wrote that about two years ago and everybody rejected it. And then uh, I got a call from Hachette about six months ago and they said, oh, Mark, um, we want to do your Matthew Flinders story, but uh, we also want to do um, we want to do Rachel Pratt. I said, like, "Oh, you beauty!" So I went and revised it, and I just sent it off today. Oh, congratulations! I'll show you, I'll show you the um, artwork for the cover. I've got it here somewhere. Have I? No, I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> That's a surprise for you. I'll show oh, you the rough. Here's the rough for the cover. Oh wow! And we've got Rachel. That's just a sketch. These are sketches for the cover. Okay, so there's Rachel helping a soldier. He's on crutches. There's another side on one, but I don't like that very much. So I didn't build that up with the writing on it. And there's one of her helping a, a wounded soldier. I'll bring that in close. 
And I wanted to use that one, but my publisher said, oh, it's too sad. <laughs> <laughs> it is very emotional. We need to, it's too emotional. I said, well, that's why I'm doing the story. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we settled on this one, which is a bit more positive and, and I think sort of shows her determination. You know, she's mm. in a there's, war zone. There's actually bombs going off around her and uh, she's still helping that, the soldier. Yeah, there, in that one, there's hope. Not that there isn't hope oh, in the other, but yeah. Well, that's Suzanne, that. my, Suzanne O'Sullivan, my publisher at Hachette. That's exactly, exactly what she said. Mm. It's people called Suzanne. We know those things. <laughs> Mark, I could talk to you all day. I was day. about to draw that um, conclusion myself. But you took the <laughs> Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I could talk to you all day, but we both better get along and get our writing yes. and our next projects done. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Sue. Cheers. <laughs>